it's a title that we give to Matthew chapter 5, which is numbers and numbers we give to the Bible so that we could find scriptures in it, because in reality, the Bible was not numbered. It wasn't separated into chapters. It was scrolls that you would read, and then as you read, then you would place your own emphasis at times at the beginning or the middle or the end, and you would read it according to just the way that it was written, possibly sometimes not the same chapter breaks or the same stopping like we do in sentences. And some Bible schools actually, I know one in Alaska that used to, that would take the Bible and print it out as one long continuous document so that you would read it in a different way. It's kind of an interesting idea. But in the Sermon on the Mount, regardless of whether we call it by the popular name or whether we choose to call it something else, it was a time when Jesus went up onto the mountaintop and he brought his disciples to himself and he sat down to teach them. But it says that at the beginning of it, it was the disciples that came to him. But at the end of it, the people heard what he had to say and they were astonished by it. And as he shared this declaration of his sayings, he told and warned people that if they would do what he said, if they kept these sayings of his, then their life would be like a house man, like a house builder who built his house upon a rock and the storms came and you know the story. And it was fine, but the house that was built upon sand got knocked down because the storms obviously would wash away its foundation and it would be wiped out. Because if you understand the whole story, it's not just the foundation that got wiped out, but the entire building. Likewise, Jesus isn't saying that these sayings of mine are an option. He's saying, if you do them, this is what happens. If you don't, this is what happens. This is direct cause and effect. This is a direct obey or don't obey. Do or don't do. Where are you when you listen to what Jesus said? That is always the issue. And that's what separated him from any other teacher in the world. Because the reality of the statements that he makes in the Sermon on the Mount when he's talking to the people and to his disciples has changed the world and the way that we look at it because no one else could make these statements and these claims and dictate to us attitudes and actions which go contrary to the very nature with which we were born in. Now remember, the nature you're born in is sin. You were born in sin, conceived in sin, raised in sin, you act like a sinner, you are a sinner, and you will always continue to fight this flesh you live in as a sinner. But, Jesus told Nicodemus that he could become born again, that he could become born of the Spirit, so that there would be a different nature inside. So we know that Jesus' words, Jesus' sayings, Jesus' sermon, Jesus speaking and what Jesus said is meant to be done. In looking at verse 9 from chapter 5, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. In all of these, we have talked about how Using the word blessed is a bracha, it's making a blessing, it's causing the Spirit of God to come upon or to come into a circumstance or situation to make it arranged in such a way that God could be there, present, because when the Holy Spirit is there, He causes it to become a blessing, which is by His holiness, creating it or causing it to come into contact with the living God. And that brecha or that making a blessing is something that Jewish sages and scholars and even to this day they say Baruch Adonai when a brecha is made it is causing that aspect of the knowledge of God and the personal intervention of God to be there so that we would know that this is something that God is doing and we want to see and have it an effect which causes us by his presence to be oh so happy because a brecha or a blessing can't be there unless God is implied in it. So a lot of times it's kind of the Western idea gets a little off when they just say blessed, you know, blessed assurance or blessed this or blessed that. And sometimes you get a little off on when you think of it as only a, you know, 
bracha sometimes in the Jewish mindset where they only stick it to one side and you kind of have to balance the two to find the volume of what God richly wants you to have when he says to you blessed are the peacemakers because they are literally blessed by the Holy Spirit and they are happy to be in that presence of God participating and being a part of that which are called the children of God because without the blessing they couldn't be the children of God I know for myself when I was growing up God we're told arranges the circumstances of our life long before we ever make a decision to be saved we don't know it we didn't plan it we get into this free will versus predestination and if you're stupid enough to get in an argument then you're kind of dumb when it comes to the reality of God because guess what God knows God did God planned and it's all done that's it that's free will versus predestination versus despair and all the other rolled up discombobulated disconfigurated ambiguousness of the theological terminologies that always go on in some type of dissertation in order to make your paper publish so that you can become a name and get a THD or a PhD. Who cares? Jesus said, and that's what we're focused on, blessed are the peacemakers. When I was growing up as a child, I used to walk to school. <laughs> Who didn't? And there were times when I saw kids fighting. And I wasn't saved. But you know, when I look back on it, I know that God was working on me because the idiot in me, the stupid, dumb, idealistic little nutcase that I was, ugly duckling such as I was, would go over and try to break up the fight. Now, I didn't try to break up the fight by saying who's right and who's wrong. That's seeking righteousness sake. I didn't go over there to say who's stronger and who's weaker. That's justice's sake. I went over there to separate and to cause the two to get along in a way where they would no longer fight the next day and attack each other in a way that would be constant and aggravating and that I would be passing by and see and feel like I needed to do something about. That's making peace. You see, you can enforce peace upon somebody like law enforcement, peace enforcement won't work. You have to make peace and come to a realization that the making of peace, the Shalom Aleichem, peace be unto you, which really means that after you found yourself in a state of peace, because the Jew knew that you couldn't make peace, but that God can make peace in a person's heart. And so what Jesus is saying here is that in order to make peace, there must be the peace of God in some way, which God implies in his brecha, his blessing, that as he being the Prince of Peace would cause peace to exist as he is there, as he is the one who is at work, because the peacemakers, if they are the children of God, can only be so by the presence of God in the blessing of the bracha, by the blessedness of saying, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall see, for they are the children of God. I know it sounds complicated. It's a Jewish thing. Hi, boy. But, you see, there were people in that day who were oppressed, and they were depressed, because Roman law had enforced Roman peace upon them. Romanus Paxus, it's called. And in order to maintain that peace, they would see a riot, come in, shoot to kill. Actually pull a sword and crucify, kill, and wipe out anybody that was there. Because when it was a matter of peace, you could appeal to Rome, but guess what? Unless they were certain you were a citizen, like with Paul, you'd probably as easily get killed because of the riots than you would be the maintaining of order, which is what was the highest law of Roman citizenship, that Romanus Paxus would be enforced adamantly. Now, if there was a cause for that riot, then they would deal with that. And that's how Paul wound up being in Rome. But the Romanus Paxus was enforced with absolute intolerance and violence. If you were creating any type of 
contrary nature to what Roman law said, off with their head, so to speak, or crucify them. So having uprisings and having riots was not part of what the Jewish culture was allowed to do. And yet Jewish expressions were very vocal, very riotous in a way, very argumentative in a way, very debatable as we see that they were actually discussing things in a passionate manner. And so often passions become inflamed and go beyond the place of discussion to antagonism. But in making peace, the children of God aren't out to create a riot, are they? The children of God aren't out to cause people to rebel against authority, are they? Jesus is saying there's something more than this enforced peace. He's saying that those who are peacemakers, those who are creating peaceful environments, those who cause the place and the setting and the home to become peaceful are blessed. And they are the children of God, not the ones whom those who were in Israel knew as being the children of God. Oh, but is it the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the children of God? Don't we have the scribes and the Pharisees telling us that the children of God are actually those who are doing tzedakahs and righteousness and doing all the things that God has said that we should do? Because guess what? We have our rabbis. We have the law. We have the Torah. We have this. We have that. We have... Oh, we have Messiah come who will free us from Roman law, who will free us from Roman peace, who will give us peace? Peace without being free from the circumstances? Jesus said, blessed are the peace makers. He said, I am peace. You, In me, you will have peace. Peace with God, peace of soul, peace inside that passes all understanding. In the world, you shall have tribulation. So when he's blessing and causing us to look at peacemaking and peacemakers. He's not saying those that force it on someone. He's saying those that are able to involve others in that type of peaceful conversation within a home, within a heart, within a life, within the very boundaries of Israel itself as it was being occupied. And as they began to realize later that even though they may lose the temple and they may lose their understanding of religious Judaic law. They could still have peace and make peace with God because the Son of God had come to them and chosen to bless them as children of God in the knowledge of himself. In all the attitudes to be and beatitudes and in all the brachas, you have to know what the core issue is and where it's pointing itself at in order to make a bracha complete, a complete blessing, you have to know who is blessing, what they're blessing, and where the blessing is going. And Jesus is in the midst of all of these. He is that blessed. He is that peacemaker. He is the bracha. He is literally the children of God as he is shed abroad in our hearts living inside us blessed are the peacemakers for they shall they are the ch for they shall be called the children of God what will you do today with what Jesus said you can say you're not a peacemaker then what have you done have you gone against what Jesus said Have you gone against the Word of God? Have you done what God said you ought not to do, but to listen to His Son? Has He not said, and is it not written, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased? Did He not tell His disciples on the mountaintop of transfiguration, This is my Son, listen to Him? 
What will you do with what Jesus said?